Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Welcome back to the program again this week. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us every week at the same time, or if you're watching via YouTube for watching it when you have time. I believe that these segments are so incredibly important, especially in the day that we're living in, that I have decided to revisit the book of Revelation, probably from a different view than many of you've heard it from before. Uh, so uh, I want you to know that if you're watching these and uh, you want to go back and study some of the things or at least take notes from them or what have you, uh, we make that available through our YouTube channel, through our podcast, and through uh, the feed for Android that we can watch it uh, or listen to it uh, through those outlets. The easiest way to go back and review anything that we have aired to date is to go to my website at lynnhiles.com and in the upper right hand corner there are icons that will take you directly to our YouTube channel that will take you to our podcast for your Apple device or there is an Android looking thing there that you can click on that will take you to a place where you can listen to the uh, uh, podcast through your Android device. Uh, we are We began last week to share some things from the book of Revelation, and we're going to make some comparisons. Some of the things that I'm going to share in this series are not on the prior series that I did on the book of Revelation several years ago that's on our uh, YouTube. These are some concepts that I wanted to share that are fresh. Everywhere I go, people are asking me these questions. And uh, what, you know, one of the things that really catches my attention is when I read the book of Revelation, it said, blessed are those who read and understand the words of this prophecy, for the time is at hand. One of the things that encourages me, or that really gets me thinking about this book, is he said, it is a blessing to read it, if you understand it. Now, a lot of what I was taught growing up, uh, it was not a blessing to read it. It was scary. And then with that came the pop culture of movies, and most of our theology has been formed from movies that are clearly even, are even advertised as fiction. When you look at the book of Revelation, let me just review just a bit from last week. I read to you from the Jewish Bible uh, where it says that this is the revelation, chapter 1, Revelation, verse 1, this is the revelation that God gave to Jesus to show to His servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Now, shortly come to pass does not mean 2,000 years and counting. And the revelation that God gave to Jesus concerning the things which were about to shortly come to pass was the prophetic word, the Bible's most famous prophecy that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 24. And even when He gives that prophecy, He begins to declare it as being imminent. When He is asked by the people standing here, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world, King James says. But the word world, there's the Greek word eon, and it literally should read the end of the age. And the end of the age and the end of the world are two different things. One is talking about a cosmic collapse, and the other is talking about the end of a covenant, the end of an age. That's a game changer. I think this word in King James James has probably messed us up more than any other, and I encourage you to look at other translations because they translate it correctly as they move forward. So he, they're asking him as he is giving the Olivet Discourse. He's standing, the context is everything. He's standing in front of the beautiful buildings of the temple, having come out of Matthew 23, where he prophesied six woes on the scribes, Pharisees, and the nation of Israel, because they were about to finally reject their Messiah, their King, whom God had sent to them. And he said to them, your house is left to you desolate. And Jesus went out, and when they showed him the temple, he began to prophesy. I said, do you see all these things? Not one stone is going to be left on another. How we step out of the context of that, that chapter and make that fit 21st century stuff is beyond me. I recently was teaching in a eschatology class, 
And I said in this Bible college, I said to them, it says, let him that's in Judea flee to the mountains. You don't live in Judea. Jesus was talking to first century Jewish people standing there at that time. And he tells them in Matthew 24, verse 34, when this stuff would occur, and he says, this generation will not pass until all these things have been fulfilled. And then I hear prophecy teachers come back and say, well, that's the generation that saw the budding of the fig tree. But the problem with that is, is that you stop time for 2,000 some years and counting and you move out of the whole, these things are about to shortly come to pass and hang it on some kind of a parentheses theory uh, that there is no biblical precedence for because Jesus uses the same word that's translated, this generation will not pass away in Matthew 24. He uses that same word in Matthew 23 when he prophesies the woes upon that generation of those who had killed the prophets and stoned them that were sent to them, and last but not least killed the son of the owner of the vineyard, that it would come upon, He told, Jesus tells them, it would come upon that generation, that the blood of all the martyrs would come upon that generation. That is reiterated in the book of Revelation in about chapter 17, 18, where he says, in her, that is in the harlot city, was found the blood of all of the martyrs. And you need to remember that all of these judgments are occurring in response to the 10th chapter of Revelation, where uh, the uh, martyrs are praying, how long, Lord, till thou dost avenge us? And so when you read the Olivet Discourse in Luke's gospel, he tells them in the gospel according to Luke, these are the days of vengeance, that all things which were spoken might be fulfilled. And so when I look at the book of Revelation, and I say that this is a revelation that God gave to Jesus to show his servants things which must shortly come to pass, I think, what revelation did he give to Jesus? Well, he gave him Matthew 24. You know, some liberal schools, and even I think it is the great uh, theologian C.S. Lewis said that Matthew 24 is one of the most embarrassing exhibitions of error in the scriptures because Jesus prophesied all of the judgments would occur within that generation, and because they didn't, that it's an embarrassing uh, exhibition of error. Well, when you think Jesus is wrong, maybe you need to rethink your theology. But what liberal schools do with that is they take our young people and say, see, Jesus could not be the Messiah because he's a false prophet but he did not, the things he prophesied did not occur. Well, I submit to you, they did occur, and they did occur within that generation, just like Jesus did, said it would, and we're going to compare those things in the book of Revelation as we continue to go through this whole series. But, I mean, it is connected from, from the martyrs that he's prophesying the judgment to them in Matthew 23, coming upon that generation, till you see it being fulfilled uh, in Revelation about 16 through 18, 19, through those chapters that in her, the harlot city was found the blood of all of the martyrs. And so you see that uh, that judgment coming upon them that was pronounced by Jesus. So what I'm going to do is show you in this segment several time texts. And I, I trust this doesn't get boring to you, but I think sometimes we need to get this uh, on uh, video so people can actually go back and research and study it. The first one I want to deal with is in Matthew, the 10th chapter. And Jesus said, is, is giving, he's commissioning uh, his workers to go into, uh, uh, into the, uh, let, me, let me see, uh, in verse number 7, Matthew 10, and as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's not 2,000 years and counting. He's telling them, tell, preach the gospel that what the prophets were prophesying about the coming of the kingdom is at hand. The time is now. He said, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Remember when Jesus would heal the sick? He said, if I cast out devils by the finger of God, if I heal the sick, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. So he is demonstrating the kingdom and what it brings with it. He said, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. 
Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say unto you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now watch this. Because when you see this terminology, Jesus uses this same terminology again in the Olivet Discourse when he says, as it was in the days of Lot, so will it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. He talks about as it was in the days of Noah, but it says that the same day that Lot went out of Sodom and Gomorrah, it rained fire and brimstone and destroyed them all. This verse also connects with Revelation, the 11th chapter, in verse number 8, where it talks about the two witnesses. And it says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, look at this. I've read over that bunches of times, but it never dawned on me that our Lord was not crucified in Sodom or Egypt. Our Lord was crucified in Jerusalem. But the Holy Spirit is taking His finger and pointing at the city of Jerusalem, the centerpiece of Old Covenant uh, Judaism and uh, the uh, apostate Israel and the centerpiece of their capital city. And He's saying that where our Lord was crucified was spiritually called Sodom and Egypt and the fire and the brimstone that came upon Sodom and Egypt did come upon that city when the Romans rained down uh, the, the, the hailstones and the fire and burnt the city and uh, all of the stuff that Jesus was prophesying would come to pass that the day of judgment was not way out in the distant future. It was going to happen within that generation. And then Jesus goes on in that same context in Matthew 10 and He says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, beware, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and scourge you in their synagogues. Now, you remember Jesus prophesied that in Matthew 24. They'll deliver you up to be killed, you'll be persecuted, you'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Again, he is, is, he's telling them this also in Matthew number 10. Now look at this. You will be brought before governors and kings for my name's sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Now, brother will deliver a brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, but he who endures unto the end will be saved. Now, he's not talking about he that endures to the end of this age. He was talking about them who would endure to the end of that age. And when he's talking about they'll deliver you up to be killed, he was talking about how people who wanted to hold on to Judaism would, would continue to rat out their brothers, their sisters, and their neighbors. I mean, take a look even at Saul of Tarshish, who was zealous for the Jews' religion and consented to the death of Stephen. Even, but he also would go get letters and he would persecute and kill those that were of this way. So they're talking about a persecution and uh, uh, not just coming from uh, the Romans. The Romans did this as well, and especially under Nero, but even the Jewish synagogues were delivering them up and they were being uh, killed and, and uh, uh, they were being scourged and they were being persecuted. And he's telling them, but if you could endure to the end, endure to the end of what? Not the end of the world, to the end of that age, the end of Old Covenant, when the city, which was spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, would be destroyed, and it would be destroyed by the Romans in fulfillment of the revelation that God gave Jesus in Matthew 24 that would shortly come to pass, which coincides with Revelation chapter 1. This is the revelation that God gave to Yeshua to show His servants the things which must come to pass shortly. Shortly. He said, it goes on to say, but when they persecute you in this city, see, He's talking he said, but he that shall endure to the end, the same will be saved. An audience he's talking to is not us. He's talking to them. And then he reiterates that and shows you he's talking to them. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I, watch this. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel 
before the Son of Man comes. Now that's about as clear as you can get that shows you that the prophetic fulfillment of these things would occur and that the coming of the Son of Man that he was talking about here, and he's really talking about his coming in judgment. And we will see that even more as we go on. But without even explaining that, you have to take the context of the scripture the audience is speaking to, and he's telling them they're going to deliver you up to be killed. People are going to betray one another, father against mother. They're going to put you to death. He, these are the same words that Jesus uses in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and, and Mark's Gospel and in Luke's Gospel's version of that. And he's telling you when they persecute in this, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, you will not have finished going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man become, has come. Now that's about as clear as I know how to make it with time text. Now let me show you some more of these time texts. If you want to take a look at them, Matthew the 16th chapter, uh, verse uh, number 27 through 28, it says, for the Son of Man will come. Let, let me go back. I, I've got that printed down, but let me go back and just pull that up actually out of the context of my own, uh, my own uh, Bible here. Matthew uh, chapter 10. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 16. Well, let me see. Let me, let me pull my notes up here again. That is the 16th chapter of Matthew. Matthew 16, I'm going to go down to around verse 20-something. Let me see here. All right, let's go in uh, again. This, let's, begin, let's begin with uh, verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This will not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but things of men. And Jesus says to them then, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what was it profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will... Uh, a man given an exchange for his soul. See, again, the context of taking up your cross and following him and denying, you know, father, mother, leaving all of that behind is talking to these disciples who would literally have to face death. I believe it was Peter who was crucified upside down. Now, I'm not saying that there's not times of, of persecution and uh, of us having to deny ourselves for the purpose of the gospel, but you can see the context of this is much different. And he's talking about what would a man profit him if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. He's talking about uh, the things that would occur within that time slot. And then he goes on to say, verse number 26, for what, is, what profit is a man if he gains the whole world, loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man, watch this, this is the verse I'm after, verse 27, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he will reward each according to his works. Now watch this verse. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This puts the coming of the Lord, and he's talking about his coming in judgment here. He's talking about his I think the Greek word is parousia or parousia, and he's saying that he's going to come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels, and he will record every man according to his works. And he tells them, assuredly, assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here, not here, back there in front of Jesus in the first century. Not my words, they're the words of Jesus, putting this squarely within the first century and in that context again. Now let's look at some more time texts. And, and uh, of course, I've already shared Matthew 24, verse 34 said, Verily I say to you, this generation will not pass till all these things are fulfilled. Uh, Matthew 23, verse 34 is where he uses the same word generation, where he said, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you uh, prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you will kill 
and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barakas, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things will come upon this generation. See, you can't take Matthew 24, verse 34, that generation, and take it out of the context of the usage of that same word, because there's no division in the chapters. Jesus is talking to the same group of people here in Matthew 23 and Matthew 24, and he is limiting it to that generation alive and well. And then he really gets specific and says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent unto thee, how oft I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and you would not behold your houses left to you desolate. Then you see that same indictment brought against these wicked people that Jesus is talking to in the first century, you see it in the last part of the book of Revelation when he talks about in that harlot city, that there would be in that city found in her the blood of all that were slain on the earth. And he specifically talks to the pro about the prophets. Now that is exclusively connected to these scriptures. And he's putting it squarely within the things which must shortly come to pass. Luke 21, verses 22. Uh, uh, this is where, again, the Olivet Discourse is written in Luke's gospel. Verse 22 said, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Not 2024, this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. They shall be led away captive into all nations. And, Jer and Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. I think it is highly possible that the times of the Gentiles was the 42 months that the Romans were allowed to travel. It was given to the Gentiles the, the, the permission to tread underfoot the city for 42 months. And it goes on to say, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth stress, distress, of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they shall see the Son of Man coming in, in, the, in a cloud with power and great glory. And when they see these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads. Your redemption draws nigh. This redemption is not a trip to heaven. It is being redeemed from the curse of the law. And when you see this terminology again, you will see uh, that also under the seals of the book, which again is an expanded version of the revelation that God gave to Yeshua, that the powers of the heavens are shaken and the, and the stars fall from heaven like a fig tree when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Now that fig tree is a symbol of natural Israel and the wind that began to blow was on the day of Pentecost when there came a sound from heaven and Peter stands up and said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel that in the last days, and Peter calls his day the last days there, when the fig tree is shaken by a mighty wind. This is all the stuff that you begin to see happening. If you don't understand Bible prophetic language, you're going to miss what's being said here. Even the fact that he comes with clouds, and I will probably take one whole segment to show you how that there are multiple cloud comings from all through the book of Revelation. And when you would see God coming on clouds, it was always Him bringing a Gentile or a heathen nation to bear and to bring judgment against the rebellious house of Israel. And He would use terminology that if you were not reading it from the Old Testament, you would think He was reading it from the book of Revelation. But He's talking about imminent judgment that would come as He would use the enemy armies as a, uh, as, a as a tool of destruction upon a rebellious house of Israel. Let me come on down through this because there's bunches of these. He says, uh, Luke 21, 31 through 32, So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, 
know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation will not pass till all be fulfilled. Romans the 13th chapter, verse 11 and 12 says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of our sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. That's Paul's response to lift up your head, your redemption is drawing nigh. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. Uh, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Uh, the context of the above scriptures are talking about not only a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time, it is also talking about being redeemed from the Roman oppressors. We, uh, a, few, a few verses above this, he tells them to render tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom was due, and, and, and to be subject to the authorities, etc. Because what he's telling them is there's some stuff that is about to happen that the day is far spent and the time is at hand. Uh, we will talk about some of the last day scriptures probably in our uh, next segment, but let me just get some more of these imminent scriptures before we go. 1 Corinthians 7 verses 29 and 30 through 31 says, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. He's not talking to us, he's talking to the Corinthians. That both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passes away. He's talking again to a first, the context of this verse is where Paul's telling them that they are, are that if they're not married, don't get married. This only applies to those standing at the end of that age. In other words, he's telling them, if you don't have a wife, don't seek one, for the time is near. People have missed out on life because they're taking these verses out of context that are imminent, uh, things that would happen and occur, not in our generation, but in that first century generation. And I'm going to deal with more of these scriptures like that, that are full of the redemptive story. I've seen people who did not get married, did not have families, and did not have babies because of scriptures taken out of context, and they've been robbed. If you don't think eschatology is important, talk to some of these people who have never had children or grandchildren and have empty lives as a result of bad theology. Well, we're running out of time. I trust you will join in again next week. If you are enjoying what we're saying, please let us know. Uh, you can uh, do that through our info at lenhouse.com. But if you'd like to partner with our ministry to help us to continue to take this message around the globe, you can do that by going to our website. The link is on the screen. You can give there through our PayPal portal via credit card or debit card. You can set up a monthly debit if you would like to become a partner with our ministry. You can also write a check and send it to the address on the screen to Lynn House Ministries, or you can call the number that will come on the screen. Someone will take your call. If you don't get an answer, leave a message and we will return your call. God bless you. Thank you for joining us again this week. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.